Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us uh, today for uh, what I think is going to be a very, very exciting session uh, uh, that uh, will it's titled, you know, VHL, uh, taking VHL to the clinic. Uh, we have several exciting speakers today uh, covering a whole gamut of topics uh, from surgical and local management of uh, VHL manifestations uh, to identification of new therapeutic strategies uh, and surveillance schema. Uh, and not last but least, uh, uh, an update on systemic therapies available today uh, for treatment of patients with VHL. We'll also have a proffered paper and a patient perspective at the end of the session. Uh, I would like to begin by telling you that this session is split into two sections. Uh, after the first four speakers have finished, we will uh, temporarily disengage and immediately commence a new session where the remainder of the speakers will, will join us. Uh, without much further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Kohn van Overdam, who is a vitreoretinal surgeon at the Rotterdam Eye Institute in the Netherlands. Uh, Dr. Van Overdam. Yeah, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you also for the invitation to give a presentation here. Okay. Uh, during this uh, great meeting, I will try to show my slide now. Do you see my slides now? Yes, we can see that. Okay. okay. Yeah, so I am uh, I want to share my experiences and my ideas on the surgical treatment of retinal hemangioblastomas. Like you said, I'm a vitro retinal surge surgeon in the Rotterdam Eye Hospital in the Netherlands since 15 years. And we uh, I have four other VR surgeons who perform VR surgery in the Netherlands, in, the, in Rotterdam. Uh, for the non-ophthalmologists, this is the anatomy for, of the eye. In the front, there's the, the cornea, the iris, the lens, and in the back, the retina. And between the lens and the retina, there's uh, the filling of the eye, the fitches. There's a gel-like uh, filling that is very important uh, for the treatment of uh, of the surgical treatment of uh, retinal hemangioblastomas, because fissures can cause complications like tractional retinal detachments. This is what we see if we look into the eye. And this I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm getting a lot of messages saying slides are not visible uh, oh. to the to the audience. Uh, Eileen, we may need your help, your technical help. Okay. Okay. So everybody who can, yeah, I see a lot of messages now saying refresh your browser. Hopefully that'll fix the problem. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, please continue, Dr. Manuel. So shall I start over again? Uh, the anatomy of the eye, the cornea, the iris, and the lens, and the retina at the back of the uh, of the eye. And in between the, the lens and the retina, there's the fissures, and that uh, is important during a vitro retinal surgery. And that is what we want to remove during the surgery. And this is what we see uh, when we look into the eye, the optic nerve with the retinal blood vessels coming out and uh, grow, uh, are lying over the retinal surface. And in the middle, there's the macula and the fovea, that is the part of the retina we use for uh, uh, the, the vision. This is what we do to examine the eye. We can use uh, lenses uh, with a slit lamp or lenses with an in, in, indirect ophthalmoscopy to look at the retina. And we also have uh, OCT scans to look at uh, the layers of the retina and under the retina. And we have uh, fluorescein angiography to see, uh, have a better look at the, the blood vessels and leakage of the blood vessels and better look of uh, tumors or new uh, changes in the blood vessels to see if there are small uh, tumors growing. We can also have, uh, we can also use ultrasonic, uh, ultra, uh, ultrasonic, 
how do you call it? No, we can also if there's a hemorrhage in the in the in the eye and you can't see the retina with your lenses, you can use use ultrasonography. Now, retinal hemangioblastomas can be uh, a solitary tumor or in, in the setting of uh, Van Hippel Lindau disease. They can be uh, uh, in the peripheral retina or near the opti uh, optic nerve, and that's called juxtapapillary. Here's an example of a tumor in the periphery. This is a large tumor. It starts always with a small change in the blood vessels, but over time they will grow. In the beginning, they will not give symptoms, but if they they uh, they leak uh, or they uh, give traction on the retina, and the macula will be uh, involved, then the vision will drop, and patients can will come to the ophthalmologist. So this is a peripheral tumor, and this is an example of a juxtapapillary tumor. So, like I said, over time they can grow, and then they they can leak, and the fluid and exudates can uh, cause the retina uh, the retina will uh, function less, which will cause uh, low vision. And this is an example of uh, a larger. Hemangioblastoma with the typical blood, uh, thickened blood vessels and uh, exudates in the macular area. This is another example with a lot of exudation that also caused the retinal detachment. And when the retina is detached, it, that part of the retina doesn't function, so you don't see it in that area. This is an example of a lot of exudation with a juxtapapillary tumor with also retinal detachment. This is a tumor in the periphery, in the inferior periphery with a lot of exudations. And these patients come, it only it, it, it's possible that the retinal detachment is there for a long time, but they don't see that, but they only come, uh, they have only complaints if the macula is also involved. This is an example of a tumor with traction uh, on the retina, tractional membranes caused by the, the tumor. And this is another extensive tractional membrane. And this is a total retinal detachment with many uh, multiple uh, hemangioblastomas. It's also a fibrocellular reaction of the vitreous with attraction and uh, exudation. If you don't treat uh, these patients, then it will become a painful blind eye. And uh, yeah, so it's uh, important to treat these patients as early as possible. The smaller the tumors, the better they can be treated. There are a few options for the treatment. Uh, only for the juxtapapillary treatment options are limited because if you treat the tumor near the optic disc or near the uh, macula, it can, uh, the treatment itself can cause a visual drop. So there are not so many options for uh, juxtapapillary tumors, but for the periphery, we can use laser, cryotherapy, radiotherapy, systemic or local uh, uh, med medical th therapy like anti vgf and also surgery. This is an example of a small tumor treated by, by laser. So the treatment, uh, the choice of treatment is uh, depends on the size of the tumor, the location, the depth in the retina, complications related to the tumor, and also maybe also genetics, genetic analysis. So small tumors, they can be treated like this example with laser. But if, we, if the lesions are bigger, larger, cryotherapy or radiotherapy can be uh, used. NS and Amina Kilis from the Erasmus U U uh, University did a systemic review and we found that uh, these, these uh, treatment options 
and uh, surgery is performed when this, uh, the tumor are larger and when there are uh, tumor related complications like uh, retinal detachment and a lot of exudation or traction. Yeah, the treatment option also depends on the when where the tumor is in the layers of the retina. This is, is an example of a patient with a juxtapapillary tumor, and I've thought of uh, performing a vitrectomy uh, because I already performed a vitrectomy because of peripheral tumors, and then she developed a, a new tumor on the optic disc, and I thought yeah, I can maybe remove the tumor, but. Uh, yeah, the, the tumor can be superficial, sessile or exophatic. And yeah, if they are in the middle or deeper layers of the retina, they, it's more difficult to treat, especially with surgery. And especially near the optic disc. Now we have also OCT angiography. This shows where the blood vessels or where the tumor is. And here in this patient, it was clear that it was in a sessile tumor. So difficult and not so removable with surgery. Yeah, there was also a pilot study performed to see if there is a difference between uh, uh, genetic analysis uh, uh, between patients with different mutations, and uh, we found that missense uh, mutations had more uh, tumor-related complications, they had more surgeries and uh, less tumor regression and more visual impairment. So if if the patient has a missense mutation, maybe in the future that can mean that we better can treat as much as possible by surgery, for example, then first treat with laser or cryotherapy. Then we do a vitrectomy. Uh, I will show you an example. This is a young boy from Belarus. He had a tumor in the superior part of the retina. He was treated with laser around the tumor, not the tumor itself. So my advice was to do a surgery because this was a large uh, tumor. So I went to Belarus to help to do the surgery together. This is how we do a vitrectomy. We have three tokars and extra lights fibers, one infusion, and a, a light pipe, and then vitrectome. And with this vitrectome, we can remove the vitreous. The vitreous is attached to the retina, especially in young patients, so we have to detach the vitreous from the retina as much as possible. Yeah, the video, the surgery is a little bit fast, but um, the surgery takes a lot of time because it's not always easy to remove all the features without touching the lens, without damaging the retina. Here you can see I removed the inner, the ILM of the retina. That's a superficial layer of the retina because then you know for sure that there are no remnants or features left on the retina and no uh, scar tissue. Then we use uh, triamcinolone. With triamcinolone, you can see the vitreous better because vitreous is clear, it's transparent, and otherwise you can't see it. And um, all the vitreous that is left can be scaffold for um, scar tissue formation and detachment of the retina after the surgery. So it is very important to remove as much vitreous as possible. Yeah, I laser the retina around the tumor because I'm going to excise the tumor and the laser will keep the retina attached. First, you have to close the blood vessels with diathermy and then you can remove it with the vitrectum. The closure of the blood vessels is not always easy because they are thickened. And so you have a little bit more chance of uh, hemorrhage spot now after the surgery. So it's very important to, to close it as good as possible. And after the removal of all the features and the tumor and with performing the laser, you can fill the eye with air or gas or with silicon oil. Air or gas will to keep the keep the retina attached after the surgery till the retina uh, the laser has good effect. Silicon oil has to be removed after a few months. 
Here are ex a few examples of surgeries for uh, treatment complications. This is a patient that was treated with laser and cryo for multiple uh, hemangioblastomas. And after the treatment, there was a fibrocellular reaction over the retinal surface. And yeah, then it's important to remove all the features and remove the features cortex that is attached to the retina. And that is fibrotic, that became fibrotic because of the inflammatory reaction of the laser and the cryo probably. So this is a patient that she was treated with uh, laser and cryo also, also uh, got more exudation after treatment and traction and a vitrectomy had to be before performed. This is a patient, she had a blind left eye, uh, right eye, and uh, after treatment of multiple uh, tumors, uh, with, uh, treated with laser and cryo on this eye. She, has also, she was also treated with laser and cryo, uh, but she developed also a tractional and exudative retinal detachment. So we had to perform a vitrectomy and we first removed all the fissures as good as possible. And then second surgery, I removed the tumors and the remnants of the fibrotic uh, membranes and the retina stayed detached afterwards. These are not so easy uh, surgeries and sometimes it's also necessary to perform uh, one more surgery to get, keep the retina attached. The better you remove the features, the, the, the more chance the result will be good. This is an example of a patient that was referred to me because uh, because of tumors treated with uh, laser and cryo, but also also um, Later. Oh. Um, and you, see, you can see that the vitrectomy was not performed completely and that's why, and the tumor was not resected. That's why there is still a retinal tractional detachment. So I performed another uh, vitrectomy and removed the tumor and the remnants of the features. This is an example of a patient that was treated with radiotherapy for a large uh, tumor. She developed uh, extensive uh, retinal exudative detachment. So we had to perform a vitrectomy with detachment of the vitreous as good as possible. And we excised uh, the tumor. This patient was also treated with plug radiotherapy and also developed uh, tractional membranes. You can see very well the, the vitreous cortex being more fibrotic and causing traction on the retina. So the better you remove it, the uh, more chance that the retina will stay attached after the surgery and it stays attached in this patient. So this is a patient I uh, treated uh, 10 years ago. It was the first patient who came to me with uh, the question if I could treat uh, uh, do a surgery for the retinal hemangioblastoma. She was blind in the other eye because of uh, retinal hemangioblastoma treated with laser, cryo, PDT, and also surgery. So then she was referred for, uh, to me because she had a tumor in the other eye, the periphery, and I thought maybe it's better not to do the same as in the other eye, not to treat first with laser or cryo, but first remove all the features as good as possible to prevent features related retinal complications. So I did the complete vitrectomy and I didn't remove the tumor at first. I thought I could better leave it, no cryo, not too much laser to uh, de decrease the, the inflammation reaction, but I closed it with a suture. And the, the surgery went well. This was before the surgery, it was, this was after the surgery and the blood vessel was nicely closed but after three months the blood vessel opened a little, little bit little bit but we left it like it was and 
It went well for 17 months, but after 17 months, there was more exudation and tractional reaction. So then uh, we did an, a second surgery and we removed the tumor. And the, the, it went well the, the years afterwards. In the two or three months after that su second surgery, three patients came to me with the same problem. And I thought I'd treat them early, no laser also, no cryo, but uh, uh, directly vitrectomy with uh, yeah, the complete, uh, complete vitrectomy and excision of the tumor. And this is an example, it's a tumor near the center with also tractional membranes. This is good to remove, uh, do a vitrectomy to remove those membranes. If you do a cryo or a laser first, maybe the traction will become worse than it already was. So if there are complications, it's, I think it's better to do a vitrectomy to remove the, the tractional membranes. Here you can see that it's in, uh, not always easy to close the blood vessels. You have higher chance of getting hemorrhages. So here we have a point-shaped diathermy. You can only press on a new instrument that I will tell you later about it. Um, yeah, also surgeries can uh, get complications afterwards. So the cataract can uh, develop. In younger patients, uh, it can take years, but uh, in all the older patients, usually uh, they need the cataract surgery uh, during the vitrectomy or within one year. If you don't close the blood vessels and you do an excision, you get, can get vitreous hemorrhages. And that is a risk factor for the development of proliferative vitreal retinopathy. That's uh, scar tissue over the retina that can cause traction and uh, a re-detachment of the retina. And um, the other complication is uh, the retinal detachment. Here's an example. There was still a tumor and the vitrectomy was not completely performed. So there's a lot of vitreous, uh, fibrotic vitreous left in the periphery and the eyes filled with silicon oil because if the, you would remove the, fit, uh, the silicon oil, then the retina would uh, detach again. So this patient was referred to me and I removed only the vitreous, but these membranes were too fibrotic to remove. So compared to uh, 10 or 20 years ago, the, the way we can do vitrectomy is much improved. We have better equipment, better machines, better instruments. The instruments are smaller and uh, it's more safe to remove the vitreous. We can uh, make, uh, we, have to, we uh, don't need to make large uh, openings in the eye. So we can do the performance surgery faster but uh, not all the surgeons uh, use triamcinolone to for the visualization of uh, vitreous. And if you don't do that, uh, you have a higher chance of uh, the uh, development of PVR and retinal detachment after the surgery. Because uh, vitreous product can uh, act as a scaffold for the development of uh, PVR. I have performed studies to show that the, the removal of vitreous cortex remnants are important. It's easy to remove it with uh, the forceps. Another uh, it would be better to close with uh, forceps, uh, but we don't have it because the instruments are so small. But with, uh, together with a technician from our hospital, we developed a diathermy forceps for in the eye. But there's, there's, they are not yet commercially available, unfortunately. But we tried it in a few patients. And the good thing 
about the diaphragm and forceps is you don't have to press on. And this could be a good option for yaxopapillary tumors. Here I open the retina a little bit, the superficial layers of the retina. Out of the retina and use the diaphragm disc because you don't have to press it. So here's another example. Yeah, my time is limited, I think. So um, this is an example of a patient that was treated with radiotherapy and also with multiple surgeries because of uh, the formation of PVR and re-detachment. Here I use the thermic forceps and the vibe. And here you can see why the retina didn't want to reattach because there was still a layer of vitreous cortex remnants that became fibrotic that caused uh, the, that, yeah, that made the retina less mobile and caused re-detachments. Yeah, for the follow-up, it's also important, of course, of the treatments. This is an example of a patient that went well after surgery five years, and then she went, she came back one year later. And yeah, maybe that would be better to see those patients earlier, in three or six months, than one year, six years, then six, then twelve months. But it depends on the patient, I think. It's also useful to use uh, protein angiography to see the smaller lesions before you see it uh, with, the, with your optomoscope. So the conclusion is we can do vitreo retinal surgery. We can uh, do it better than uh, time, uh, 10 years ago, but it's important to do a complete trajectory, look at vitreous cortex remnants and uh, um, closure of the blood vessels is also important. Thank you very much. Thank you.